Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares, and as Israel today celebrates its 66th year of independence, we take this opportunity to focus on what many call the startup nation. We're joined today by Israeli engineer, inventor, and entrepreneur Dov Moran, and co-founder and managing editor of Israel's Financial Daily, The Marker, Ethan Avriel. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us, first of all. 60 years, 66 years of independence. Do we have reasons to celebrate, or what do you think? It's always a good reason to celebrate. Uh, this is, uh, after all, a real miracle. There was nothing here 60 years ago, and now there's uh, quite a lot. However, one should not just rest on our laurels. We should look at the problem and try to fix them, because some big ones are looming ahead. OK. Do you have a comment on that? I would say, first of all, uh, every reason to celebrate, celebrate. And the fact that we have a country, it's a reason for celebration. And I absolutely agree with Ethan that we should uh, strive of, uh, of uh, correcting things, doing things better. Okay. But still, compared to what we had before, wow. Well, we're going to discuss all of this in more detail. We're going to give our viewers a chance to actually decide for themselves as well. Let's take a look now at what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had to say about the Israeli economy in an interview with Israeli economic journalist Guy Rolnik. Eitan's co-founding partner at Israeli Daily, The Marker. I have to make sure that there is no concentration of great power. And in this, um, in this task, I think we've done quite a few things in Israel, but we have a way to go. And in any case, you never come to a resting place. You never stop competing. And now in the global economy, we have to be doubly competitive, not only with our firms, but in our macroeconomic policy and our social policies and our education policies. We have to compete. We're competing all the time. It's an open market. You are aware that in Israel, we have a very strong sentiment among many people, especially the young, that we are not a meritocratic system. It means a lot of people think that in order to get ahead, you have to be well connected, and talent wouldn't be enough. Are you aware of that strong public sentiment? I'm aware of it, and some of it is justified, and we have to fix it. It's, uh, but you fix it by having monopolistic power stripped away into competition. Eitan, do you think that Israel's economy is under threat of crony capitalism, that only the people who actually have the connections in politics can get ahead? Um, yes, but. So, um, we have a very serious problem of crony capitalism. It has been proven that a certain list of people have access to capital and have access to the parliament and to politicians and to high-ranking uh, uh, officers in the, uh, in the public sectors. And for uh, the last uh, couple of decades, have been able to get themselves a uh, rent sort of uh, situation, whereas uh, they build uh, groups of companies. Sometimes they manage to charge monopolistic prices from uh, the public. The true fact is that Israeli, in Israel, the prices are much higher um, than in most countries in Europe, even, where, uh, where, cost of, where, where the salaries are higher. In fact, in Israel, the cost of living is much higher than, uh, than, than in Israel. It's really frustrating, Israeli, that they have to pay twice for a razor and twice for the same hummus that we actually manufacture here compared to the price in the United States. And so yes, we have a problem, and the only reason for that is competition. Why don't you have competition? At the end of the day, somebody managed to strive it. Okay, thank you very much, Eitan. Let's move on now to Israel's high-tech market, clearly one of Israel's biggest achievements as it celebrates 66 years of independence. Dov, you're one of the founding fathers of the Israeli uh, high-tech sector as we know it. Uh, you've had successes, you've had failures, you're the inventor of the discount key. Uh, what do you see the Israeli high-tech sector as, as being in terms of its future? I mean, we saw Waze this past year as one of the many successes. Um, but do we have another Waze coming? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Israel uh, high-tech is a clear demonstration of uh, what uh, we have as Israel. It's unique, uh, different, uh, strong here. Uh, this is the entrepreneurial uh, feeling. They, they're willing to... The, 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 uh, the ability to move out of the box, to do things which are unique, different, uh, take bold moves, uh, not just rest with, uh, uh, with a, a job that uh, you know, exists for years. And, uh, and uh, th th that's a very, very nice part of the, of the Israelis. Yet at the uh, same time, we have I mean, all these different startups, but you know, as soon as they get a little successful, they get bought out and we lose all the talent, isn't that? That's, that's an issue, but uh, in general, uh, if we are a country, with the, the startup nation, we are a country with a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of uh, uh, high-tech understanding, 
uh, many, many young people that really want to do something different, ready to do something, and work very hard and sacrifice for that. And that's very, very nice. Clearly, from the many, many startups, the, the flow is that uh, many fail, some become larger, and then from those ones, uh, some become even larger. Mm -hmm. And there are a few which are really succeeding to become uh, big companies. Unfortunately, not enough, uh, not enough because of the system in Israel, which doesn't encourage actually uh, this. What do we uh, need in order to go from being a startup nation to being a high-tech nation? It's, it's a very important question, and, and really a lot of the Israel future relies on this question. Uh, there are many, it's, it's a complicated there issue, many, but there if, many answers to it, I think. if I take one specific aspect and talk about it, that's the issue that in Israel, our pension money uh, is handled in a way that the, 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 the funds, the organizations who handle the money practically have no motivation to take any risk, have no motivation to really invest invest in order to make our money better too. And that's the meaning of getting into uh, understanding companies, really do the investment process that they are theoretically doing. They're not doing it. They, are, they, just, they just don't invest, the, they do invest the money. They invest money in a very shallow way, which actually guarantees their profits and they're very profitable due right. to it. Right. But uh, it's not the, the, the fund that really uh, get into large investment, understanding who they are investing in, and therefore do a good investment. It leads into a situation that the high-tech companies in Israel that are going and nearly, nearly, really need investments in order to be successful, do not have the so resources, and actually what they have to do is to, to be bought, okay. uh, for, or to uh, disappear because of the lack of money that is required for them to go. Right, okay. So we're going to move on now to Israel's natural resources. The country mostly got its startup appetite out of necessity. For lack of natural resources, Israelis had to be innovative. But in recent years, Israel emerged as a giant energy player following the discovery of billions of barrels of crude oil and gas, enough to supply Israel's needs for more than a century. Let's first see a public message from Yitzhak Tshuva, owner of Israeli conglomerate Delic Group, after the discoveries of natural gas reserves in Israel's coastal waters. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloenu. Israel is an energy independent nation. Israel is turning today into an independent energy superpower. What this means is that we'll start looking at the potential of gas export. We're a totally independent country. Furthermore, all countries want a piece of our findings, and we can take pride in our discoveries. The meaning of this is great geopolitical strength compared to other countries. There's tremendous demand for this gas all over the world. So it's clearly a blessing that um, Israel found all this gas, but it seems to all be under control of one or a few people. Is it dangerous to Israel that only one person essentially has so much power? It's, it's unprecedented in Israel, isn't it? Well, the answer is yes, but I want to give a, a bit of context uh, yes. here. Uh, uh, Israel is no Saudi Arabia. It will never be. Uh, it's not Kuwait. These are not the numbers. Yes, there might be enough gas to supply Israel for 30, maybe 35 years, but it's not a game changer in the sense that everybody is going to be an oil sheik in, in Israel. Now, uh, there, was a, there was a debate about how much gas to leave in Israel and how much to export. That has been settled. It's 60 percent for local and 40 percent for export. The big issue now is why one company Actually, two, an Israeli company called Delek with a, a, a shareholder, major shareholder called uh, Itzhak Tshuva and another company called Nobel, an American company, basically have capitalized and they're basically uh, um, the, the owners of, well, not the owners, but the operators of not most of the gas right. that was found in Israel. That is a situation where it, they, they might be able in a situation to uh, um, set the prices. And if the situation would have been different, if we had two or three companies competing between themselves to the one or three big clients in Israel, such as the electric company, maybe the prices would have been uh, uh, quite lower, mm -hmm. and maybe people will have to pay less for their uh, electricity bill. So uh, the situation is such that we found ourselves, nobody has planned that. Uh, 
20 years ago, nobody wanted to drill anything, and he was the first, and was, right. uh, and was willing to put money. It's his luck that it happened, but still, the gas is the is the the, uh, the uh, is Israel's gas. It belongs formally to the people of Israel. It, it does not belong to the guy who found it. And the situation that one guy controls basically all the fines is a bit dangerous and probably not very good for competition. Okay, thank you very much. Let's switch now to other topics relevant to the discussion on economics in Israel on its 66th birthday. <laughs> Let's start with a comment by Israeli author and politician Avram Berg regarding how Israel's economy and society have changed since its inception. Israel of 48 was established as a state with two pillars. It was a secular and a social democratic reality. Now, so many years later, Israel of 2014 is neither secular nor socialist. It's much more religious and very capitalist one. The transformation actually is a transformation into a, tour, into a new realm, a realm in which our economy prosperous, but the social solidarity is reducing. And this is the balance. The better the economy is, the worse the society goes. And the challenge in front of the leaders of the Israeli society, both governmental and polit political and social and civil society, is how to reacquire a better equilibrium for future Israel. So how do we acquire a better equilibrium for Israeli society and economy? Ah, well, you, you have to pick up your, your fight and pick up your battle. Uh, there, there are quite uh, a lot of issues. Of course, the big, one of the big issues is uh, equality or inequality, if you want. Uh, by all the numbers that have been uh, put uh, forward, Israel is one of the most unequal nations in the developing developer world. We're basically just, uh, uh, just a little bit better than the United States. And, uh, and so uh, something has to be done in the sense of helping those who are less fortunate in, uh, in Israel. Uh, not so much in actual giving them budget to, uh, to, uh, to continue living, but, uh, but to, to uh, incorporate them strongly into the right. more productive society. So everybody knows that in Israel we have an issue with Arab and specifically Arab women who don't work. We have an issue with ultra-Orthodox, most of them, or almost uh, more than half of them do not uh, actually uh, uh, work, demand, right? but uh, the men. Uh, but even if you take all this aside and you look at the rest of the secular uh, uh, population, you find that they are maybe half the population still is earning, is, is working, but is earning very low wages. So how to do that? Basically, education and try to uh, uh, give them better skills, maybe even incorporate them in the startup uh, economy that we've talked about before. Okay, Dov, actually, on that note, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think that the, the formula is uh, not just how to cut the, the cake differently, but how to make the cake larger. Uh, clearly, this is by uh, having the very religious and Arabs into the cake as, as participants, as uh, people who contribute to the economy, uh, bring value, true value uh, into the industry, into Israel, and into the world. Uh, we need, I would say, a smarter, uh, more sophisticated, more high-tech type of, of government that really cares, that uh, is striving to peace. Peace is very important and would bring to us a huge, uh, advantage, huge economical advantage. Okay. Uh, will create a great country. We are only 60 years old. Right. Well, it's let's talk in, such, let's such talk in concrete terms right here yes, for exactly. a second. Because in terms of real estate, for example, I'm someone with a young family. I mean, it's very hard to buy a house in Israel. I mean, some people talk about a bubble. Other people say, no, it's just a lack of, it's a shortage of housing. That's exactly the issue. So that was talking about uh, uh, policies and how you're going to do that. And the fact that in Israel, there are a couple of, a couple of, there's a group of walls that you have to take down. One of the walls, for example, is that the country has to liberalize uh, the land that, that it actually owns and, and set free or try to sell or market much more land than they do now. They actually hold land and trade it as if they were profit makers, which seems to be wrong. That's on land. Why, why doesn't the government do that? 
Um, the, there are a lot of reasons. It's very complicated. There are, there are a lot of laws. Uh, uh, the country of Israel, and especially the public sector, has become uh, almost in the United States very uh, judiciary. Everybody is looking behind their shoulders at the law. Nobody wants to do something that will put them in a bad light. Uh, Everybody is sort of uh, so holding. Is there a bubble it, in Israel, it, though, I mean, in terms of the real estate sector? Definitely a bubble in the terms. How do you define a bubble? One of the ways to define a bubble is that prices have gone very fast, very high, much more than it would make sense, for example, compared to what you earn and what many other Israeli earn. So, yes, it's, a, it's definitely a bubble. But, you know, in economics, bubbles can stay inflated right. for a very, very long time, sometimes even decades. Okay, Doug, quick word, because we have to leave. Uh, any, com any comment on this in the real estate sector? 66 six, six, six years. It's, uh, we are not a child, but we are not an old uh, man. Clearly, we should not be or, or strived. Clearly, okay. we should not be in a position that we talk about biocracy. Okay. We have to. We have to end here. Thank you so very much, Dov, Moran. Thank you very much, Eitan. Thank you, Avriel. We have to go. Thank you very much for watching. Happy Independence Day for those of you who are in Israel, and join us again tomorrow.